Welcome. Welcome all to our closing day plenary of ASTMH 2020. We are in this session gonna be tackling one of the most important issues of our time. We started the meeting uh, discussing climate change, one of the biggest challenges of our planet. And we are ending with one of the biggest challenges of our peoples, how we live, work, and play together. Um, I am President ASTMH, Julie Jacobson, and I am the co-chair of our Inclusion and Respect Task Force with my colleague, uh, Dr. Jonathan uh, Stiles, who is here with me co-chairing this session. <clears throat> In the Inclusion and Respect Task Force, we've had uh, the challenge of, uh, of starting to put on paper what we have as a society have believed, hopefully throughout the entire time uh, since we were uh, put together in 1903. Um, and we have put one of the first challenges with putting together our inclusion and respect policy. And, I, and hopefully you've seen this because it's been flashing up on your screen a bit between sessions. And I just wanna read two pieces from that. Uh, to you just as a context of what, um, what we're thinking about here as a society. As a society, we are committed to the open exchange of ideas, freedom of thought and expression and productive scientific debate that are central to our mission. These require an open and diverse environment that is built on dignity, mutual respect for all members, participants and staff free of discrimination based on personal attributes. In a world of rich diversity, the advancement of science depends on the intellectual breadth and depth of a diverse ASTMH, one that informs and enriches and shapes the context of the scientific dis discourse. So this task force uh, has been very kept very busy in recent times. Um, we have a statement on racism, we, and we did a survey of our membership to find out and understand what's happening with the members, both inside and outside of the society. And one of the issues that has come up is the importance of addressing the colonial, colonial roots of tropical medicine. Uh, a, a majority of the, of the members felt this was a very important issue for us to talk about and discuss openly and think about how this reflects on how we work together in the future. And with that, I'm gonna pass over to my co-chair, uh, Dr. Jonathan Stiles. Jonathan, over to you. All right, hello everyone, good morning. And so um, as uh, Dr. Jacobson said, uh, the uh, recent killings of uh, unarmed black men and women in the United States, uh, coupled with the devastating effects of COVID-19 pandemic on people of color have brought racial injustice especially against Blacks, to the forefront of society. And in fact, our society's global health activities in the coming years uh, will contend with race and social justice issues in unprecedented ways. So we are delighted that the society included today's conversation with our standing speakers to increase our awareness of the role of colonialism, racism and social injustice in global health disparities and also present some ideas on potential interventions. So in this symposium, we explore the history of the field of tropical medicine with its roots intertwined uh, in colonialism and racism and reflect on how educational institutions and societies of tropical medicine uh, can move beyond this complex history to be forces of global health equity and justice. So I'll pass it on to now Dr. Jacobson, who will introduce our first speaker uh, for the symposium today. So we are delighted to have an incredible set of speakers with us today. Um, our first speaker is uh, Dr. Lenny Golightly. Dr. Golightly is an Associate Professor in Medicine and Microbiology and Immunology and the Associate Dean of Diversity and Inclusion at the Weill Cornell uh, Medicine. Raised in the U.S. Midwest, she attended Wayne State University, receiving her MD degree from Weill Cornell Medicine in New York City. She trained in internal medicine in Harlem Hospital, serving as a chief resident, followed by a fellowship in the Harvard Combined Infectious Disease Training Program and postdoctoral research fellowship at the, at the Harvard School of Public Health. She is specializing in infectious diseases. She has lectured and trained undergraduates, medical students, and fellows from both the US and abroad, including those from Haiti, Ghana, Brazil, Israel, and Qatar. Her research in malarial pathogen pathogenesis and infectious disease diagnostics has involved collaborations in Haiti and Ghana, amongst other places. She is a member of the National Medical Association Council on International Affairs and has served on many ASTMH uh, committees. <clears throat> 
With that, we are welcome you, uh, Dr. Go Lightly, and look forward to your comments. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate um, this uh, invitation and the opportunity to speak to the members of the society who have uh, sustained my career since its inception. And uh, I echo, um, to begin with, oh, that of, of Dr. Stiles. Uh, why are we here and why are we talking about this? We're here because a man was murdered. Horrifically, on film. And it started an uprising and a realization that what many had already known, that there were people that were killed routinely because did their lives matter? So all over the world, people began to question and to ask, what's happened? Why has it happened? And so I invite you to explore with me some thoughts through that lens. And again, looking at what are our roots of our wonderful society? How do we intersect with imperialism? going to another place. From where you are, you somehow dictate what goes on in another country. You take things from that other place. And colonialism, where you go in and take the place over, it doesn't seem to be perhaps something that we might have right now, though there are people in this audience who know all too well about it. I love this quote from one of our former presidents, Peter Hotez. Neglected tropical diseases, the most important disease you have never heard of. Yet, that's where we started, studying those diseases that no one ever heard of, and that all of us have heard of and study and talk about all the time. But those diseases were really discovered in the period of colonialism for the West, beginning in the late 1800s and the beginning 1900s. And as was mentioned, we were founded in 1903. So what I'd like to do is to look through this lens of what's going on in the United States and colonialism and interweave it with our history of the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. And I'd like to do it to borrow from the um, indigenous healer, uh, Donald Warren, by walking through history to truth. Just take a moment and we'll walk through history to truth, hopefully in the coming moments. And so I'd like to begin with a little truth by acknowledging that I'm sitting in New York City on the traditional territory of the Lenape people. So how are we going to walk through history? Well, let's do it through some narratives. I'm not a historian, as was mentioned. Um, I'm really an infectious disease person who studies predominantly malaria. But a narrative to the historians is, is a way of telling a story. It's a way of understanding history. And as any narrative, as you might think, there are things that you leave in and things that you leave out. As I mentioned, since we're starting with the murder of Mr. Floyd, I'm going to center in on a history that he and I kind of have in common, which is we are both descendant of slaves. And it's that intersection because you see, I'm an American in a place that was colonized, but I'm here because when it was colonized, some other people, black people from Africa got brought over. So the transatlantic slave trade Millions of people, 10 to 12 souls, were brought over to this hemisphere from Africa. The wonderful poet and author Maya Angelou said in her wonderful book, All God's Children Need Traveling Shoes, that which one of us could know that years of bondage, brutalities, the mixture of other bloods, customs, and languages had transformed us into an unrecognizable tribe? She said that on her return to Mother Africa and thinking about herself, so what's happened in this journey that we end up with someone being crushed to death? What happens that we find ourselves at this juncture of trying to have deep introspection? So what might the narratives be that we have thought about or not thought about? What are the parts of the story we leave in and out? And so I'll try, start with an example of a narrative. A Birmingham, Alabama jail cell door. This is at the News Museum in Washington, DC where they look at history through the lens of news articles, what his press had to say about it. And the woman here is standing in front of the jail cell door where Martin Luther King had been jailed behind that door. And I was in the museum one day and there was a small seven or eight year old white boy with his white grandpa. 
And the little boy looked at the door and he said, Grandpa, why would anybody put Dr. King in jail? Because what was the narrative he knew about Dr. King? Well, he was a great man, of course. He was a wonderful man. He was for freedom, the sterilized story of the freedom rights movement. I don't think he knew about what had happened behind that jail cell door, about the letter that he wrote to the good Christian people of the time who told him to be quiet and to stand back. And, and, and standing at that door as I did, you couldn't really imagine, which is here, kind of the depravity of, of where he was jailed. And I'm sure the little boy knew some of the things that he said about there needing to be justice everywhere and how we were all connected. So what did the grandfather say about why Dr. King was in jail? He said, well, it says here that he was marching without a permit. That's true, but that's not the whole story. But the story that we get are pictures like this. So can we look inside and outside and in each other to find the truth and to look for all the parts of our story? Another example, beautiful Southern plantations here in the United States where the slaves were and where the masters and mistresses were too. As of late, they've started telling the stories of the slaves also as shown here on the right. And the people giving the tours have said they've gotten some pushback on that. One young woman said, someone said to her, listen, I just wanted to say that dragging all this slavery stuff up again is bringing down America. But that's the story, that's the truth. That's what happened. Can we deal with it? So our society, there are many societies. We were in 1903, they weave in another society that predated us a little bit and how they've had to reckon with some truths. So the American Medical Association, American Medical Association was founded in 1847. Some of you may know the Civil War was 1861, 1865, and in 1868, there was the 14th Amendment, which forbids denying equal protection under the law to all citizens of the United States. But the AMA looked at that and they thought, well, you know, we, we have a problem. We need to let women in. Except one of the members said, well, what about the black people? Well, no, that wasn't going to work. So the decision was made that they would leave it to the local societies to decide who could be a member. Now, mind you, you couldn't get into the AMA if you didn't belong to some of these local societies. And, and their rationale was that um, it, it, to those denied membership should not claim the legislative power of, of this association to pass ex post facto laws for their special benefit. In other words, it was not the AMA's problem if they couldn't get into these other societies. But these weren't just social clubs. This was how you were able to get training. This was specialty training. This was how you were able to be on hospital boards. This was how you even be able to get admitting privileges. So it really set up the dynamic of separate care. The NMA, the National Medical Association, which is mentioned I'm on the International Committee for, was founded because of that. But can we forget our history? Yes. Joan Reed at Harvard University, uh, told the tale recently of how someone said, why did you people go off and do that? Make your own separate organization. She said, they didn't go off and do that. They were denied admission. Women were ultimately admitted to the AMA in 1915, Blacks in the 1960s. But the way it was done and the way it went on and on and on, ultimately an apology was issued in 2008. This is what you call institutional racism, something that is un underneath and it cloaks everything. And you can say, well, why didn't people, why weren't all they on the hospitals? Why didn't they have these specialties? But there was an underlying rule which prevented them. So what about us? Chandy John in our presidential address, his presidential address in 2019, um, I loved it. He, he gave a series of poems and he had a poem called I See You. And it's kind of a, an association he had almost metaphysical connection to a Ugandan child. And he said, we'll redo the experiment. We'll correct the calculations. 
We will not say a word until we know every detail is right. And then he went on to say, except inevitably in medicine and science, we all do make errors and we don't talk about them. This is a society of people of good heart who care. I know that many people listening and, and thinking about this have had the same sort of a feeling that you go out to try to help, to try to do good in the world. But what don't we talk about? Well, I can tell you that from that initial founding of our society, unlike the AMA, we don't have all of those records. I can tell you that Chandy is one of only two presidents who are not American. I can tell you we've only had seven women. And although we've always been international, so it would seem that we had people of different races, not necessarily in power. So it's there. It's there for us to see. It's there for us to think about. Are there vestiges of that beginning that have led to the consequences that I'm talking about now? So what is this colonial attitude? Where, did, where, where does that come from? Um, Helen Tilly in her uh, treaty on medicine, empires, and ethics in colonial Africa talks about this. That when you go in and you take over a place, what are the things that were done? Some intended, some unintended. What are the consequences to the people there? You go in, you say, oh, there are diseases we're going to study, we're going to help, but the military's there with you too. And these patterns linger, these ways of thinking about people and cultures may stay with you. Warwick Anderson in Colonial Pathologies, American Tropical Medicine, Race and Hygiene in the Philippines talked about these intertwined histories of tropical medicine and racial thought. In his treatise, Ex Excremental Colonialism, Public Health and the Poetics of Pollution, which I have to say is very difficult to read. He talks about how American colonial health officers um, were dealing with feces. And the concept is we know, and again, I'm an infectious disease person, that yes, you know, eating poop's not good for you. Uh, we, we do have to be hygienic. Um, for those in uh, the United States, you'll know there's another run on toilet paper related to people's fears with COVID-19 for reasons I do not know. But it was serious if you read this. The horrible things that were said, because it was set up this dichotomy between people who they were discovering had organisms in their feces that had not been analyzed or looked at before. And these people happen to be Filipinos. And so you have to keep the dirty Filipinos, and they use much more horrid language, away from the good white colonists. And there's whole way of looking at the other versus us, and many times in the names of science and exploration, the sterile labs and the dirty other. But how does that come in today? How, how might that narrative play out? You know, when I was reading this, I thought of, of something, and, and you can't make these stories up. But years ago, as many of you, you know, I was traveling, I was out working, and um, I met someone at the hotel. She was a Black American also. And she was a financial person. And she was there to inspect the wells. She worked for an organization that had dug wells so that people could have clean potable water. And as members of the society well know, that happens to overlap with many diseases the world around and it's a very important thing so i we talked about the wells and then the next day um i asked her how were the wells and she said well the wells were fine but my goodness there were feces and she talked about that and i my good infectious disease uh, mode said yes we need to have education and all about public health and that night I'm from New York City. You see the lights of New York City here. Very wealthy place, United States. And of all things, I always say the good Lord has a sense of humor. I was told how a group of children, maybe one I kind of sort of know, had been found in the beautiful garden on the Upper East Side doing things in the bushes. And it was funny. It was a joke. And I thought about that, but... Change the names, change the places, change the times. Who's doing it? Not the children of academe in the garden being naughty. But maybe 
dirty, filthy bodies of the other, ignorant people. Do these thoughts or, or does that past hang with us? Narratives, ways of looking at stories. Back to that Civil War period. The picture on the left of people digging graves. The way we like to look at what happened for many of us Black Americans is that freedom came and everybody left and wasn't it wonderful? Now some of us and mostly all of us know it wasn't quite that easy. A lot of things happened. And one of the things that happened was that without any infrastructure, without any place for them to go, without many of them actually being declared citizens yet, they were declared contraband, people who left. And they would go to the soldiers, the Union soldiers, and they would be there in camps, refugee camps. And many people died. Of four million slaves, a million died. Smallpox, cholera, stories untold. And as in the dedication to the book for uh, Jim Downs, the emancipated who never reached freedom. So how does this sort of a thing move on? How does that affect us? Kamara Jones, um, a former um, president of uh, the American Public Health Association, has an allegory that she uses about racism. And she tells the story that she and her husband had bought a new house and they had um, flower pots and they were anxious to garden and they went and uh, they started to plant the seeds and they realized they didn't have soil in all of the pots. So they went and they got soil for the flower boxes. And she says she came back a few weeks later and she said, Oh my goodness, something must be wrong. In one set of flower boxes, there are beautiful plants, even the ones that weren't you know, that healthy looked, looked really good. In the other ones, hardly anything. They were barely growing. And she realized that in one pot, there was the original soil that they had had, and the other one was the enriched soil that her husband had gotten. And she makes this comparison of looking at this through the lens of race. Where have you put the good soil? Where have you tilled the soil? Where have you watered it? What if you have an attitude about one box versus another? What if you like, she'll, she'll use the, the um, allegory to say, what if you like red flowers and you tend the red flower pot better than the pink flower pot? And what if that goes on and on and you reseed and eventually you think, huh, that's because there's something wrong with those pink flowers. Never for remembering or thinking about the soil and how that racism may continue and cause problems. And who is the gardener? Are we involved in that? Have preceding gardeners set up these sorts of relationships amongst us or amongst the people that we would seek to work with? In Ghana, I heard a preacher say um, a saying, and he said that the Lord sends rain, but the ground is hard. How might that play out in our own stories? This is Solar Riley. He was a farmer in the South. He had five children. The youngest, Leslie, was my mother. He died when she was nine months old. I grew up hearing that he died because it was a hunting accident. And he died. In my 20s, though, I heard a different narrative. There was a hunting accident, and they put him in a wagon, and they took him to the doctor, but they wouldn't see him because he was a descendant of slaves. He was Black. And he died a week later of gangrene. In trying to find out was that true or not, I asked some relatives, and one said, well, you know, Lenny, it was pretty far out. I don't really know, but... Maybe they couldn't get to the black doctors. You know, they were farther away. Were they farther away because of what had happened with the AMA? Were they farther away because they didn't have hospital facilities? Perhaps the most chilling story I heard was from a cousin who said, well, you know, Lenny, I don't know that whole story, but it doesn't surprise me. I can remember being a small child and going for health care and sitting in pain, and I couldn't be seen until the last white person left. How do things go on and continue? And while we're talking about that, what about abuse? Tuskegee study 
Many of you know the story of how the US federal government didn't treat, didn't treat 400 black men for syphilis, even after penicillin had been discovered, even though they had a way to do it. Many of them died, their wives and babies were infected and it's changed and affects even now how research is perceived in our communities. Or Henrietta Lacks, whose cells were used in, in um, medical research, used for the polio uh, development of the polio vaccine. And yet the legacy of that was only discovered later on. And although great pains have been made to try to rectify these sorts of wrongs, they stay with us. The concepts of separate but equal, though done away with supposedly by the Supreme Court in cases related to education here in the United States in the 1950s, are still with us, are they not? My grandfather died because of lack of medical care are all things equal? Well, I don't know. I am, as I sit here down the street from a hospital that has big banners saying they are the number one orthopedic hospital in the country. And if you're a New Yorker or you know anything about us, that means it's equivalent to the world. And I had to go and have my shoulder checked out. So the daughter of someone who may have died because he couldn't get care or got suboptimal care was there. But are things equal? No. No, at this very conference, we've heard about people here in this very city, other people of color who don't have those same privileges, who because of a series of events over time, don't have the same rights. The new, as always, is rooted in the old. Paul Farmer's book with his colleagues um, and a chapter on colonial medicine and its legacies. These things are with us, but what are we going to do about them? Will we recognize them or can we recognize them? Sometimes old things take a new twist. This is Lucius Barker. He was a phenomenal political scientist. Um, he was the uh, chair of political science, both at Wash University and Stanford. And he was also my godfather, that's me. And he was deprived of the right, well, it, I shouldn't say he was deprived, but the story is that he went to vote and he had to answer some questions about the 14th Amendment. Some of you may know that right now in the United States, there's a little bit questions about voting and rights and who can vote and whose votes counts, but it takes a little bit of a different twist than answering questions about the 14th Amendment. I should say that I understand that all of Uncle Lucius's students had to take that test about the 14th Amendment. So what are the ways that these inequalities might be here? And again, taking the conceit of looking at it from the American perspective as an African-American, Mary Bassett, the former head of public health here in New York City, and uh, currently at Harvard as the director of the Health and Human Rights Center, talks about the ways in which societies foster racial discrimination reinforcing systems of housing, education, unemployment, earnings, all coming down that these discriminatory uh, practices reinforce each other. It's depicted here, it, it kind of feeds on each other, right? So that if you start out without, it's perpetuated through rules unseen, maybe not even known as some of the examples I've given you. And what might be the result of that? Well, we're academicians. So black Americans in the United States currently comprise about 14.6% of the US population, yet is on the left. How many are full-time faculty on medical schools? 3.6%. How many scientists and engineers? 5%. Is that part of the legacy of what has gone on before? As you know, that's a hot topic. And again, frameworks carried forward from these colonial times influence what goes on today. The policy making table and global health agendas and how they are prioritized. And it's not just here, those same structures are found throughout our different educational systems. We've talked about our societies in different countries throughout the world and how we interact with each other, maybe in how we get grants, 
maybe in how we decide, how we divide up, how much overhead different people get depending on where they are. As the incredible Roger Glass and wonderful gentleman uh, says, we need to have a decolonization of the mind. Where are our minds? We need to change how we look at global health, examine the systems, and maybe take a hard look at ourselves in the mirror. When I started out long ago, I went to Trace Brussels, Brazil as a medical student. I ended up going to Haiti as a resident, a place where slaves had risen up. I then went to Ghana, a wonderful place, following, I guess, in the steps of, of Maya Angelou. Each place, I was a little older and a little different. And I wonder, what assumptions did I carry with me? I know I always felt that I got more than I gave. But what ways did I interact? What harm could I have had? And what ways can I work now to try to do better? When my father died, I found going through his papers, a three by five card. And so this attribution may not do complete, but it said something about a farmer's almanac and it says, have enough education so no one can look down on you and then enough not to look down on anyone else. Do we have that much education? Do we look down on others? My mother used to say, and she said she was just a good old uh, girl from Mississippi. She said, go ahead and get all those fancy degrees, but have some good old common sense. Maybe common sense means the same as my father's three by five card, that it should be common sense that we should know better. It should be common sense that we should make right the wrongs if we can. 2016, Stephen Higgs, the president then in his address said, the impact of what our members can do has never been as great as it is now. I honestly believe that we do not know what will come next, but our membership is critical for whatever it may be. The world was in the midst of Zika at that time. We're in the midst of COVID now, in a major civil rights movement that has consumed the world. I think he was right. I think that members of the society are the good at heart. People listening here and members are from all the corners of the earth. As was said recently in the Harvard Business Review by Robert Livingston, the real challenge for organizations is not figuring out what can we do, but whether but rather, are we willing to do it? Are we? Are we willing to look deep and make the changes? Not just at, at the overall, not just say, oh, there's structures, but at ourselves, to look ourselves in the eye. This slide is usually at the beginning of a presentation, but I put it at the end. No, I don't have any financial interests or commercial products or services or anything related to this talk. I have a deep, deep personal interest, a vested interest in my people, and my people are all the people. And I think you feel the same way. People who have gone out, who try to fight the good fight. And I think that we are a society that can do this, that can look each other in the eye, can face the hard things, and can work together to move forward. I'd like to close by acknowledging uh, that as before, I am not a historian. I got some good help from friends. Um, I was a Ford Foundation fellow and many fellows I wrote and, and they referred me to people, to Jim Downs and Gabriela Soda La Viega. I thank the panelists who are going to speak and give their wisdom. I spoke with them to Karen Goraleski, who's wonderful and provided me with information about the society. And I can't end without giving Many thanks to my mentors and colleagues all, and James J, who many years ago let me into his lab when all I wanted was money, but he said, well, you know, the point of this thing is for you to learn some research. I think somewhere he's smiling, not only at me, but at the society, because an academe with a good heart knows others with good hearts. So thank you very much, and I look forward to our conversation, and I hope this isn't the first are the last, it's the first of many to come. Thank you very much.
We can't hear you, Julie. Thank you, Lenny, for a very thought-provoking and, uh, and compelling talk that I think will lead us into a lot of discussion. And uh, just to the audience not to forget that you can uh, pose questions that we will put to the panel at the end. Um, I would like to introduce our, our uh, first of our discussants, um, Michelle Kahn. Michelle Kahn is an associate professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine with a visiting position at the Aga Khan University in Pakistan. Dr. Khan's specialist is, uh, expertise is on improving systems and policies with a focus on governance for infectious disease controls in South and Southeast Asia. In addition to a PhD in social epidemiology and an MS from the London School of Tropical Medicine, uh, Dr. Khan holds an MA in natural sciences from the University of Cambridge. She's a founding member of the, the, the London School's Decolonizing Global Health Group, a, a consultant at the Chatham House Global Health Program, and sits on London School's Governing Council. Um, Michelle, over to you. Thank you very much. And um, thank you, Lee. That was, a, that was really, really fascinating. So much to, to think about. So I've got a few minutes, and I'm going to um, dive right in. Uh, so we started off talking about, we've heard a lot of words, and, and, and in this society, but also in the, the, the London School and elsewhere, we're talking a lot about um, inclusion and diversity. And I'd like to start by thinking a bit about, you know, there is a, there is a difference um, between inclusion and diversity and concepts around racism um, in that my sense is that when people talk about inclusion and diversity, it's, it's often seen as a, as a good to have, um, whereas racism is something that's that's illegal and discrimination is something that's much, much more um, severe and damaging. Um, so, so I think that's something that, that's worth having in mind and, and, and how um, racism really elevates some people to positions of power um, at the detriment of others. The other, the other thing that's been pointed out is at least, and in my talk, um, what I'm gonna focus on is the, the structures and the society, the structures and society and in, institutions rather than individual acts, um, which are also clearly important. Um, but let's assume, you know, we're here today, we're all focused on social justice. Um, but even so, if we are operating within organizations in which the systems are perpetuating racial or national hierarchies, then unless we're actively reforming those systems, just by passively being part of those institutions, we could be perpetuating racism. And this becomes a problem both from a social justice perspective, but also prevents um, excellence in, in public health. So what do I mean by um, structures um, and systems that disadvantage? So I'm just going to share a simple example. Like, when we think, you know, who is a global health expert and what makes somebody a global health expert? I think the majority of people would say, well, you know, it's somebody that's got a lot of a lot of publications. You see them on the news a lot. They're obviously they sit on editorial boards, and I mean, obviously they also need to have a degree from a leading public health school, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And if we take a step back and think about um, whether these criteria or attributes themselves that we associate with um, what makes a global health expert are actually harder for um, people of color or uh, people from low and middle income countries to be successful in, then we might start realizing why actually the systems themselves disadvantage people. And what, what this does, so, let me, um, you know, we um, when I was discussing with Lenny, we were saying this is a society of scientists and we like evidence. So there's a lot of evidence for this, um, that even um, everything from being able to get published or being quoted in the media is, is certain groups um, because of their racial or national, um, their, their nationality um, or, or their um, race are less likely to be successful in that. So this is one um, study of a randomized trial of English, uh, 347 English, English clinicians uh, who were shown an abstract. And um, when the source uh, of the abstract was, was changed um, so that they perceived it to be originating from a higher income country rather than a low income country, and then they were asked to score how valuable the research was, that change um, significantly improved how they viewed it. So they viewed the same research coming from um, a higher income country source as being more valuable. So this idea that 
we as um, scientists are objective, I think requires uh, some, some degree of, of questioning. And then it goes back to this idea that if certain um, criteria are less likely to be met um, by uh, people from lower and middle income countries or uh, with certain characteristics, then clearly that, that means that the system is, it makes it harder for them to succeed. And we see this happening. So this is a study that I and colleagues conducted last year where uh, we analyzed the, um, the ethnic uh, composition of a faculty in the top uh, 15 public health universities. These were um, essentially across the US, um, UK and, and Canada. And what we found was that uh, we, we categorized people using a software based on, on their names. And what it found was that um, white men from the British or North American um, ethnic grouping based on their name heavily dominated senior positions, even though um, at junior and mid-level positions, there was a lot more diversity, um, both in terms of gender and, and in the, the um, ethnicity of people. And we see something similar. This is a report from Global Health um, 5050. So this actually doesn't include academic institutions, but includes um, the leaders of global health um, institutions outside of um, academia, including in the private sector. And it found that only 17% um, of, of uh, leaders of global health organizations are from low and middle income countries, even though the majority of this work is being um, being done in those countries. So I, I hope that you know paints a picture of the fact that power, leadership, um, et cetera, is concentrated within, um, within certain groups of people, so white people or um, people from higher income countries. And then therefore there's, there leads to this Western dominance um, in leadership position. And apart from the, the social justice um, implications of that, I also want to make the case that it, it, it influences the way that we practice um, and uh, global health research, uh, career, uh, the careers of teaching. So, for example, when the leadership of an organization, um, such as an NGO, for example, is, is really dominated by people from um, higher income countries, that shapes the way that they interact with the context. There's a sense of solutions being imposed and the value of expertise of local, um, local stakeholders often being underlooked. It impacts the way that people collaborate on research um, and that local, uh, pri local priority topics are not uh, emphasized enough. We hear again and again um, on global health teaching that, that students can't connect to the faculty, they don't feel represented, and there's a colonial um, style of, of delivery, partially because they don't see that the faculty um, is, is as diverse as it should be. And finally, um, which I think is a really important self-fulfilling part of this, is that people are known to hire in their own image. So when you've got um, a recruitment board or a promotion board that's largely white or high income country dominated, it biases who they recruit, who they promote, and also biases um, or has an impact on the way that candidates um, feel that they are suited for, for the role. And then this creates a cycle of white or Western dominance um, in leadership positions. So my, my final slide, I'm going to you know, put some questions out there and I hope there'll be more. We know that there are these issues, but um, are there the incentives um, for reform? We, we have to wonder whether a system that gives certain people power, we know that, that it's, it's always difficult to give up power in any situation. So um, how, how do we create the incentives for reform and how do we best present the case? We've talked about it in terms of social justice here, but what about the argument of efficiency or effectiveness? And um, my closing thought, do we need an independent review of how the global health sector is functioning? Are we really brave enough um, to examine some of the, the biases that might be um, at play? Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Michelle, uh, for 
the presentation. So at this time, we want to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Thomas Levist. And Dr. Thomas Levist is Dean of the Tulane University School of Public Health and uh, Tropical Medicine. Uh, he has written over 150 scientific articles, uh, numerous mass media outlets, and is executive producer of the Skin Your In documentary series about racial inequalities in health. He is also author of six books, including Minority Population and Health, an Introduction to Health Disparities in the United States, the first textbook on health disparities. He's an award-winning research scientist, and he has received the Innovation Award uh, from National Institutes of Health, the Knowledge Award from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and was elected to the National Academy of Medicine in 2013. And so we introduce to you uh, Dr. Thomas Levis. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for the invitation to participate in this important and fascinating conversation. I'd like also to, to thank my colleagues on the panel, Dr. Goodlight, Golightly and Dr. Khan, for their um, brilliant presentations. That um, was very informative. I learned quite a lot just listening to them. And as I um, listen to these presentations and reflect on, um, on this conversation, I come to this um, from a quite interesting perch, I think. So I am not an ASTMH member. I am not an expert in tropical medicine or even in global health. I am a Black American from the Northern United States, specifically New York City, which means that I'm literally a Yankee, but I am now the Dean of the School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine in the Southern United States. My first time even living in the South. And as I reflect on these uh, presentations and on this topic and on that experience of moving to the South in the, just uh, two years ago, you know, it makes me think about narratives narratives, which I think is a, a, a word that, uh, that, that kind of a thread that runs through the two presentations that we just heard. And I think uh, the overall issue of the history of tropical medicine and its, its colonial past is all about narratives. Who controls the narrative? Who writes the narrative? And which narrative gets to be the dominant narrative? And I was thinking about an interview that I recently did with a a news reporter asking about um, the COVID-19 vaccines and um, um, and how uh, the difficulty that we project we're going to have in getting people to accept the vaccine in the United States, in particular African Americans and other people of color, because of distrust. And 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 I was asked by this reporter specifically about the role that the Tuskegee syphilis study played in creating that mistrust. And he seemed to be coming from the perspective that it was about Tuskegee. That was why the distrust existed. And that caused me to reflect on a study that I did some years ago. We did a survey of people. And um, this was black and white Americans uh, that we surveyed. And we asked them, had they heard of the Tuskegee syphilis study? What we found was that only a minority of people, black or white had ever even heard of the Tuskegee syphilis study. The majority of African Americans have never heard of the study, didn't even know what happened. And then among those that said that they had heard of it, we asked them a series of factual questions about, you know, how many men were involved, how long did the study take place, a few other factual questions. And we found that very few people had the facts right about the study. So most people never heard of it. Among those that had heard of it, most of them knew very little about it, or basically, basically nothing. Um, and there were no race differences in any of that. So there were no race differences in who heard of the study. Both blacks and whites hadn't heard of it. There was no race differences in how much they knew about it. Both blacks and whites didn't know much about it. And then we read a description of what happened you know, to the people who said they hadn't heard of it. And we asked them, do you think this could happen today? And this is where we found the disparity. So most white respondents said, oh, of course not. This could never happen now. This was something that happened a long time ago, way off in the distant past when we used to be racist. But it could never happen now. 
And the black respondents almost uniformly said, of course this could happen today. This is important because it's not some historical event that leads to the mistrust. It is mistrust, untrustworthy behavior, both in the past and what's happening today, that produces the mistrust. The mistrust comes from a very logical and rational place. In fact, if you don't have some mistrust, I sort of wonder about you. What is your, your sanity? So moving to the South, it causes you, as a, as a Northerner, it causes you to, to engage with these sort of narratives because in the United States, we had a war, a war between two factions. One faction that wanted to expand rights and freedoms, the other faction that wanted to control and contain rights and freedoms of people. The two factions continue to battle in this country maybe not um, through war, but through other means, political means. And the faction that wanted to expand rights, that is the Northern states, the states that did not secede from the nation, won the war. But when you come to the South, what becomes clear to you is that while the North won the war, the South won the narrative. And the narrative about why the war existed, why the war happened, what the fight was about is a complete different narrative, right? And this is why as I drive down the streets of New Orleans on my way to work, I drive past Robert E. Lee Boulevard, a major street named after Confederate general. I come to a stoplight at Jefferson Davis Parkway, street named for the Confederate president, and then have to pass the intersection of Jefferson Davis Parkway and Martin Luther King Boulevard. And think about the fact that somebody had to literally climb a ladder and post those signs. Robert E. Lee, I mean, sorry, uh, Jefferson Davis and Martin Luther King intersection. If I'd thought more about it, I would have maybe brought the picture so that you could actually see the photograph of it. But I will, uh, I will tweet it out to, uh, to those of you on, um, those of you on uh, Twitter, uh, Twitter who would want to see this. So we grapple with this past. And now as a dean of a university in the South, named for a philanthropist that supported the Confederacy, and serving now as co-chair of a commission at the university that's been charged with um, coming up with a policy on renaming buildings and spaces and memorials on campus. You think about this past and what do you do? Do we simply ignore the past? Do we take down the signs? Do we change the name of the building? Do we remove Robert Lee Lee's name from the street? Do we drop the name tropical medicine from the name of our school, Tulane University School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine? How do we grapple with this past, I think is the, the, the issue that we must address. And I think the way to address this is to be truthful to that past, to speak that truth boldly and truthfully speaking all narratives, all sides of that narrative, pointing out what is factual and what is not factual. And until we begin to speak that truth of that past, but take advantage of the fact that the baton has been passed to this generation, and now it is left to us to be the generation that will finally wipe out the stain of racism. And we do this by using our control of resources, such as the School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine, such as the American Society for Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. Use it as a force to redress that difficult past so that in the future, as future generations look back on their past, our present, they see a present, they see success, they, they see their predecessors as ones who were bold enough to acknowledge that there is this troubling past 
not seek to erase that past, but rather educate about the past so that we all have factual information about what actually did happen, but that the story in the future becomes a story that incorporates that negative past combined with our present, where we are making strides to become a non-racist non society and using the power that we have to bring that about. So that's my reaction. Um, I thank you for your attention and look forward to the conversation. All right, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Thomas uh, Levist and uh, 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 Michelle Kahn. And uh, we really appreciate uh, your perspectives on, uh, on the topic. At this time, uh, we would like to have a conversation, a discussion, uh, based on the questions that uh, we'll be receiving uh, from the audience. And I believe, uh, uh, Julie, uh, you might have uh, a couple of them coming in. Um, yeah, so uh, I guess uh, before uh, we get into uh, those from the audience, I would uh, like to ask the panel um, just a, a question from my end, and which is, uh, that um, um, members of the society are uh, involved in a lot of uh, research projects and uh, programs, uh, both in the United States and, and overseas. And so um, the question is, uh, how do funding agencies uh, and the recipients of these uh, uh, funds uh, manage uh, the power relationships um, with uh, global health equity as a driver, uh, because uh, in many instances, we find that um, uh, the power relationships uh, tend to uh, create more problems um, uh, when it comes to uh, racial justice, uh, inclusion, and cultural competence. Wondered uh, who would like to give it a shot. <laughs> I'm happy to, but Michelle, maybe you want to go first. I mean, I think that's really one of the things that, that you will deal is what are the structures um, that um, lead to some of these inequities? I mean, we can each individually be aware that, you know, you, you, if, if, you, if you have a grant or you have a project, as she pointed out so well, um, looking at the authorship, looking at who's in charge, making sure people get credit, making sure people that there's an equitable distribution of money. As I mentioned, there's some impediments built into some of these granting um, agencies uh, here in the US. How much overhead do you get if you're overseas versus here? These sorts of things. Um, but I think that you have to open your eyes and look um, and consider it. Um, otherwise, you just continue to perpetuate a problem if, if you think, well, I'm the one who's doing this and that and, and not thinking of, of the other person and the other people as, as the same as yourself, and, and also investing in trying to change the system. But but Michelle, what, what would you say about that? So I would, I absolutely agree with what you said. And I would, I would maybe even take one step back to say this, um, this idea that, that global health and global health institutions are all about increasing equity and social justice. Let's, let's see. Sure, that, that's one definition of what global health is, but actually some of the institutions themselves, another, another definition that I've read recently is that global health is actually a brand that's used um, to describe the work of um, uh, high income countries in extracting information, um, knowledge, power from low and middle income countries. So I think it's important also to recognize that um, if we take the example of um, academic institutions for for them to really distribute power um, and resources, what does that mean then? That they're going to have to become um, less, le ha ha try and have less less students and, and have a better distribution of where degrees are being um, distributed. Uh, if we think about journals, if we think about conferences, are we asking the very people who are benefiting from the system to play a role in dismantling it? So I think that's, you know, that's a question to raise, like, is global health really actually about um, equity? And, you know, if we look at the COVID vaccines at the moment and who's buying them up and how they're being distributed, can we really say that global health is about equity? Yeah. 
All right, and uh, um, I guess any more comments from uh, the panel members? All right, so um, Julie, do you have any questions from the audience? Yeah, we have many questions from the audience, so I hope we have a lot to choose from. Um, uh, so uh, we have some questions that kind of focus. I'm gonna I'm gonna wind some of these together. There was one clarification from a point that uh, was made in Dr. Golightly's talk, and the clarification was about um, the the two presidents being um, not not American. At, so out of and I can clarify this. Oh no, born abroad. That were uh, they're non-white, so they were self, that non-white. So of the last five presidents, two of them were non-white in the last five years, because that's what we uh, analyzed in the in looking at the last five years of leadership. Um, yeah, so it was um, uh, that was just one clarification. But it can, it comes into and weaves into a question on narrative, and I'm going to bring this into a, 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 um, from Professor Njiri Wame, who who uh, says it's a very interesting and important and relevant com com conversation. I commend ASTMH for pioneering this conversation and believe it's the beginning of working towards addressing this from the space of tropical medicine and beyond, step by step. And she asks if it's possible to begin by a, a closer scrutiny of abstracts and presentations in the in the annual meeting, ensuring that people um, don't use openly offensive language, um, hearing about this disease is of origin X, X or Y imported to the new world with X or Y people during X or Y period, um, which don't add value to the presentation. So I think this comes into how the narrative is told and how different groups interpret that same narrative that one may find offense and not. And so my, I guess my bringing this to the panel would be, how do we find the way and how can we be sensitive to those uh, things that may provide uh, or produce offense to one group or uh, but not add value to the overall scientific content? Yeah, I think you really have to listen um, to people. And, and, and I think we also have to kind of walk a little gently in each other's gardens. Uh, is sometimes people will use language or say things and, and they don't mean offense. They don't know the history. They don't know about that. And so I think that, that what I would hope the society would be would be a place where we can talk about it and say, hey, you know, that is really just not a good way to say that. But not to just go and accuse a person of being a racist or something, because they may not have any intent like that. Um, it happens here. Uh, Dr. Levice was talking about the difference between the North and the South. You know, I've had to adjudicate sometimes um, arguments amongst uh, people that were all of color, but they felt offended by terms that were used that were not necessarily pejorative one place or another. So I think it's fine to say, you know, that term offends me and to let someone know and then to keep going. Um, and so I think that that's something that I, I hope, again, we could be open about and uh, be able to um, not be accusatory. Now, you read earlier um, the uh, a platform that the society has taken for people who may really truly not be good souls, if you will. And, and, and that's different though, um, from trying to have a dialogue. And I should also say, if you're trying to get at these um, underlying issues, it's very hard if you can't talk. If you're afraid that anything you say, somebody's going to, you know, say, oh, you bad racist, you or you're just a colonialist thinker. I mean, you can't get anywhere. It, it's the old story for those who have children of, of the kids um, uh, learning how to write something. And every time they, they write something, you're correcting the punctuation so they can never get out the poem or the thought. So I, I think we have to try to step back, at least give the benefit of the doubt, but then to indeed talk about it, to tell the narratives, because one of the things I think that has happened over time is that we, we just don't talk about it, and then we can't address it if we don't talk about it. That was an, that was an excellent answer. I, I completely agree with that. I think that's, the, that's right. We have to have dialogue, and often what people do is they want to cancel the other person out. So this idea of cancel culture of you know, you said something and it offended me, therefore you're canceled on what we will, we will not even have any dialogue about it. And that doesn't produce, that doesn't produce progress. So you, we need to be able to be comfortable enough to speak um, plainly and know that from time to time, we may say things that would be offensive to others and others, people who are offended 
need to be empowered to indicate that they are offended and why, and then we can have some conversation about it if we do it in a non-accusatory way. But I think that's that's the key. The other thing I wanted to say, you know, since since I have the floor here, is that I I think that you know teaching that that colonial history in tropical medicine is something that should be a part, it should be a core competency of any training program in tropical medicine. Anyone going into this field needs to know that this was the history of this field and that these are the mistakes that were made and that we don't want you to now go into different countries and doing this work with this same idea and make some of these same mistakes, which is very easy to happen um, because it is very easy to offend people from different cultures when you don't really understand fully what uh, the, the, the culture. So not only should we be teaching that history, but there does need to be training around cultural humility so that when people go into other countries and do this work, that they have some understanding of how to engage with people that have different values, different views, different ways of seeing the world. Um, and, I, and I do think that this should all be core to the, to the uh, curriculum of every one of these programs that are training people to do this work. I couldn't agree more. It's, it's, it's quite shocking, um, actually, that it isn't um, already. And, um, you know, in addition to the humility and, and when people, you know, you have so many students going in and doing research projects in countries they've never been to before. And, and it's, it's hugely important for them to have that training. But also as part of these courses, I would suggest a reflection on the role of, um, say, higher in income countries in developing the systems that we're now um, battling and, and, you know, the creation of poverty. I think all of these things, it doesn't have to be one thing that's taught, but to, you know, for having people come out without ever hearing um, that part of the story, I think is creating a bunch of public health practitioners that really aren't um, fit for purpose. Exactly. Jonathan, maybe we can take another question from the, from the audience. Um, we have, um, I'm, I'm going to combine again uh, uh, two questions that have to do with, um, with the naming and renaming of things. And so from Dr. Jessica Fairley, um, many giants of tropical medicine were, who were very involved in the start of ASTMH were, um, were unapologetic, unapologetic racists. Gorgas comes to mind. What can we do to overcome this? Do we need to have a harder look at our medals and consider renaming them? And then I'm going to also move from that one to another one that came from Riyadh Muhammad, um, who said, uh, who has, has questions about, is removing the names from buildings, streets, et cetera, allowing us to erase a past, pretending it didn't exist? Wouldn't keeping them and having a plaque next to those in the areas be an option describing the history of the of the overly racist uh, icons? So. Yeah, yeah. This is an issue that we're grappling with right now at the university, and the, the commission that I chair is dealing with this issue. Um, you know, this, this idea of erasing history. First of all, it's impossible to erase history. History happened. It, it can't unhappen. So history did happen. The question is, how do you acknowledge and tell that history? I believe that street signs are not history and not the place that we teach history. So I believe that there is no justification for any Confederate to be honored with a street named after them anywhere in the United States. They are traitors who committed treason against the United States and killed American soldiers. They should not be honored and through street signs. Now monuments, statues, I think that there are a place for that. There is a place for that and that is in museums. That's where we teach history. And I think that those monuments should be in museums where they can be sources of education and we can have conversations about that. In terms of changing the names of buildings, again, um, changing the names of buildings is not history, right? So the history is what it is. I think it is uh, appropriate in, uh, in some cases to do a recontextualization of that. So maybe you can leave the name of that building as it is and you put a plaque up that tells the full narrative about this person. Um, why is the building named for them? And what is it about this past that maybe is more, more ignoble and that, that should be a part of what's, uh, that story? Or maybe you do change the name of the building to something that's more appropriate, but you have a plaque that says this building was once named after this person and this is why it was changed. So there are ways to deal with these issues. Um, uh, it's not just a matter of erasing history or anyone's heritage or, or any of, of that. Uh, but remember that that heritage that may be a source of pride for some may also be a heritage that's a source of pain for others, and that we have to also be thoughtful about all sides of this. 
So what I would say about name, changing names of metals within the association, I think it would be appropriate, and I'll say this as a non-member of the, of the society, to maybe have a committee to look at uh, establishing a policy on who should be honored by the society. Is it, what are the principles that you would go about uh, to determine who would be honored today? What were the principles in the past? What was the thinking about why the medal was named for that person? And is it appropriate to still name that, that honor for that individual? Or maybe it could, could be recontextualized. So I, I would think it gives, giving some thought to this is, um, I think would be perfectly appropriate, but it should not be done in a precipitous way without uh, serious reflection. And if I could just um, add, um, and because it's not not specific to this society, right? The the people who are celebrated often do have um, racist pasts, or, and and I think one of the things to learn from this, for me, because it it influences the present and the future as well, is the lesson that that someone can be an excellent scientist but but hold very racist or prejudiced views at the same time. And this idea that scientists are objective is I think very, very damaging because it, it, it ends up closing a lot of conversations about, oh, well, the panel is, it's a great panel. It's a really experienced panel. They're really great scientists. And it's like, yes, but um, they still might have uh, biases. And so in addition to changing the names, I think we need to reflect the fact that we're having this conversation shows that, that people can be great scientists, but also have problematic views. Right. So uh, I, have a, I have a question here, and uh, since most of uh, our members are involved in um, training and mentoring and education um, in the field of uh, tropical medicine, uh, the question I have for the panel is, uh, how do we train the next generation of global health researchers uh, in a way that uh, some of these uh, uh, mistakes that uh, we talked about uh, are not repeated? I think okay, you I'll... have to be. Oh, no, you go ahead. <laughs> no, no, you go ahead. You go ahead I, just, I, I think you have to be open about it, and and I think that um, not it's it's not even just the past. I, I think that yeah, I, I I agree with the the idea that that should be part of the core curriculum. But if you're always looking in the past, you're not looking at the problems in the present, um, and how easy it is for anyone. Uh, and, and, and I deeply believe that. I think that's what kind of keeps us from going that route is instead of thinking, oh, those evil people did this or that and is, is to think, you know, maybe that could happen to me. Maybe I could start to think that way. What, what was that slippery slope that got that person to do that unethical study? Um, how did that happen? Uh, what was the thought process? Again, uh, uh, things come at you in different ways. So I think I think that part of the training should be to be reflective, to be respectful, to learn about what is other, that maybe other is us. And, and I think that, that it shouldn't just all be about the science and getting the paper and getting on the committee and all of the things that are important for progress, but that part and parcel of that should be an understanding of, of our common humanity and, and that we should insist that that be part of what we do, if for no other reason that we know what happened before when we didn't. And Tom? Absolutely. Well, I mean, I, I really don't have much to add to that. I mean, I think that's, that's exactly right. You, uh, it, you, have to, you have to kind of teach that history as, and as well as, you know, kind of what are, what are the things that's happened in the past? What are the things that you need to be thinking about as you're designing your studies and you're doing your work so that you don't make those mistakes? And I think that's that's exactly right. And I don't know that we do that sufficiently, only focusing on the methods and techniques and science, but I do think teaching that history is vital. It, I think it's a core competency. And frank, frankly, I think you're you're not competent to do this work if you don't have that, uh, that background. Yeah. And Jonathan, if I can, I'll read one comment that's related to this, and then I could do another question from the audience. Um, so this is from, I'm going to really not do a very good job on this name, so I apologize. Dr. Aishitu Abukar Sadiq. Um, I believe the ability to teach young people and especially children to quote, see the supposed superior group, end quote, in this case whites, 
are also humans and not superhumans would assist in providing marginalized populations or races to seek and stand for their earned positions. I distinctly remember as a child in West Africa, Nigeria, attending Catholic school run by British nuns, which was the best school at the time. We were made to believe it was a privilege to be trained by whites. Gradually, the education system in the country made a decision to employ indigenous teachers and train them to provide education instead. Now, young people in my country don't generally feel less for not being white. Being white has ceased to be an achievement or a success. Being yourself is seen as an achievement now. How do you think the disadvantaged races and peoples in the United States can collectively teach a new generation a, a different sense of self to value their uniqueness? I love that. Um, it's interesting actually, in, in, in terms of saying in the United States, someone recently uh, who was not originally from the United States said to me, uh, group actually, he said, you know, when he came to the U.S., he discovered that, that there were there were two things. You could either be white or non-white, <laughs> but he would never be defined for what he actually was. And I think <laughs> that really speaks to that. Um, but yes, how can we all? Because the United States isn't just black and white. It isn't just this or that. How can we cherish all? And, and I think that some of the ways we were talking about re-looking at those narratives and really defining who do we respect and why, quote unquote, respect. What are our, uh, uh, who do we uh, cherish? Who do we put on the pedestal? Um, in what way and why? And, and to rethink it. But I, I love that. And, and again, remember, that I, I like the way you said how he learned as a child by seeing this, that that was just part of it. You go to get educated by the smart white people, therefore you must be less than. I, I really think that's great. Um, yes, yeah, so I think I was going to say, Jonathan, going back to your question about how, you know, how do we change what we teach? I think it also, we need to change who is doing the teaching. If, if, if it's always the same type of people that are in the teaching and expertise role and the other group as being the learners, the less experienced, it's just not going to work. And, and that's why I referred um, to the study I conducted with colleagues, which, which really did highlight this, this idea of both students, but also junior, junior faculty constantly seeing that they are a much more diverse group than, than the, the leaders and the people who are really um, the teachers are the ones who are successful and, and it, it has a huge impact. Right, right, right. And, and I agree with you because uh, uh, that, that is uh, something that, is, that needs to be worked on in the United States uh, uh, as we speak, especially uh, representation in terms of underrepresented minorities uh, participating in global health research uh, is really astonishingly um, a few uh, that are involved in it. And so, um, again, in terms of increasing uh, the number of, um, you know, the individuals from different uh, backgrounds, uh, uh, increasing diversity would also help uh, reduce uh, the impact of uh, uh, racism and uh, exclusion of different populations uh, in, in this research field. All right, so Julie, do you have any more questions? Yeah, there's one from Dr. Uh, Chandy John um, to Linny and all. These were amazing talks. Can you provide one thing that we can get started on right now to address racism and colonialism, their legacy within, a within ASTMH? I realize there will be no quick solutions, but it would be great to have input from you on specifics that we can evaluate a year from now, a way to see what we have done so that there is some action and not just talk. I think, and you can fill me in a little bit more, but you've done a survey. I think that's important to look and see what people think. And I think that the other thing that I would strongly advise uh, and I, I think I've advised it to people is, is that we have someone from outside, an outside consultant, look at the society and give us an opinion. You know, it, it's very hard from when you're part of it, I can sit here and say I'm a black woman, but I am part of the society. I have grown up in it and I'm an American. And, and so you really need someone from outside to take a look in. I, uh, I remember years ago, a, a woman who was a consultant for uh, schools, so I have kids, and she said, you know, it's in, 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 in terms of diversity, she said, it's, it's not the, the places that are known, quote unquote, known, 
um, for being good schools for diverse education, uh, uh, that they're the ones that have the problems. It, it's hard to speak to the good of heart. And so I think having someone come in from the outside and look at our structures, look at those uh, possible institutional uh, racist structures, if you will, and, and to, to give us an opinion, I think that would be something that we could do. And then with that direction, move forward, also knowing the way people within society feel. So I think those would be two actionable items uh, that I would advocate for. I mean, I could say, I, I, I agree. I mean, I was gonna say an independent review is, is, is just hugely valuable. And um, the sort of concrete things one could look at is, you know, the, the, the criteria for selecting on, on who gets to participate in the meetings, to the journal, to, um, you know, who gets to rise. And, and, but, but as Lini said, it, it, it is quite hard to assess yourself. So having someone external come and have a look, um, not, and I, I think the benefits of that wouldn't just be in terms of better, you know, from a social social justice perspective, but also the quality um, of, of of science and, and public health that the society can do. So I think as the as the non-member, non-society member here, I, I I think you need to be bolder than than all of that. I mean, I, I think uh, having an external review is is a good thing. I think that's a good start. I think you need to create a strategic plan around around what to do in this space. I would be bold and set a goal. I would set a goal for increasing the diversity of the membership as well as the inclusion of uh, you know the inclusion within the culture of the organization. You could you could create a training program to that you know would you know recruit high school students to come into fields that feed into tropical medicine. Um, and mentor them through co through college and all the way through, you know, through the uh, graduate programs. You could create a commission to review uh, the names of medals and honors that the association gives and come up with a policy on exactly what to do about cases where you maybe have policies, I mean, uh, honors uh, for people that maybe you don't feel as comfortable honoring any longer. You could, cre you could um, have an officer uh, uh, a new office created within the organization uh, that would be someone who would be responsible for building out this aspect of the society. You know, um, maybe a new, uh, I don't know, second vice president in charge of diversity and inclusion or some other such title. You know, I think if you want to make a difference, you need to be bold. And I think that the way to do that is to, and also you want to institutionalize these changes. So changing the organizational structure to incorporate someone who is tasked with ensuring that the organization is moving the, this agenda forward would be a way of institutionalizing it and making sure that it's just not something that happens during the present administration of, of um, you know, President, President Jacobson and that future presidents will also have support in building out this aspect of the organization. Excellent call to action. Um, Jonathan, I'm getting um, multiple messages that it's time for us to wrap this up. So um, I'll give it over to you and uh, thank you all to, from my, on my behalf to the panelists. And we, we do have a survey that's looked at not only racism, but uh, it, bias and inclusion. Uh, we will be reaching back to the society and having a plan. That is what we have. Uh, it's on Jonathan and my plate, <laughs> but over to you, Jonathan, to wrap it up. Sure, sure, sure. And uh, I'd like to say thank you uh, to all of you who, who participated uh, on the panel. Uh, we thoroughly enjoyed it, and uh, we believe that this is not the end of it, uh, that um, we will continue to take action uh, to ensure that uh, some of the mistakes of the past are not repeated uh, in the future. And i also like to say that um, uh, we are very pleased um, at what uh, the society is doing uh, to ensure that uh, some of these uh, changes can take place. Uh, Compared to others, um, very little uh, is, uh, has been done with, with the other uh, organizations. And so at this time, uh, we'd like to thank all of you who had a chance to come to listen to us. And uh, we hope that uh, you got some gems uh, from the conversation that you can take home and uh, make us uh, better people uh, for that. So thank you all. Thank you so much for having the symposium. It's awesome. Thank you.